So uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 19. Philippians 4, 4 through 19. Here's what the scripture says. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedon from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. They are a fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We today are living in a very divided nation and world. We are divided politically, we are divided racially, we are divided economically. Any way you look at our world, our world is divided. We live in a very hurried up, rushed world. A world whereby we have very little time or we seem to be able to take very little time to really communicate with one another. Oh yeah, we get our phone out and we use Facebook and we say, well, I've got so many Facebook friends and I communicate with those Facebook friends. How personal is that? Not personal at all, is it? We have lost a lot. I, I remember in the days when I was a youth growing up, we would every Sunday afternoon go to my grandparents' house. And I tell you, if somebody was driving by and they would see us out in the yard because they didn't have air conditioning back then, they'd see us out in the yard, they'd pull over and stop and get out and join the conversation. We live in a totally different world. So today I ask you, are you really content with the way your life is today? I've got a secret today. A secret for contentment. I found that secret here in this passage of scripture that we read. I'm reminded of the, in Budapest, a Jewish man went to see his rabbi. He went to see the rabbi because he had a complaint. He said, life is unbearable for my family. There's nine of us living in one room. 
What can I do? The rabbi thought for a moment about that problem, and the rabbi said to him, Take your goat into the room with you. The man was incredulous, and the rabbi said to him, No, I'm serious. I want you to do exactly as I have asked, and I want you to come back in a week. Well, the week passed by, and the man returned, and he was looking even more distraught than the first time that he was to the rabbi. He said, We cannot stand it. That goat is nasty. That goat is filthy. We cannot stand it. The rabbi said, go home and let the goat out and come back in a week. Well, the week passed by and the man returned and this time he was excited. I mean, he exclaimed, life is beautiful. We enjoy every minute of our lives now. There's no goat. There's just nine of us. You see, when people consider how to be content in life, there are times when we tend to think like that. They think, well, you know, it could be worse. It's kind of like the poem, from the day of your birth till you ride in a hearse, there's nothing that happened that couldn't be worse. There's some value in us looking at life that way. That as we face life, we need to realize, yes, it could be worse. And if that helps us to learn to appreciate what we have, you know, that's great. Appreciation for what you have is one of the keys to being able to experience the peace of God. The Apostle Paul writes there in Philippians the fourth chapter, verses eight and nine, these words. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Then notice what he says. Whatever you've learned, whatever you've received, whatever you've heard from me, whatever you've seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. There's great value in focusing on your blessings. But you see, I was a little surprised as I read this total passage of Scripture to discover that this mental exercise was not the primary cause for the Apostle Paul's contentedness. And indeed, I would say it would be difficult for a man like the Apostle Paul to be content just because he counted his blessings. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, he speaks of the endurance that he had to experience. He said, I endured hardships, I endured distress, in beatings, in imprisonments, in riots, in hard work, in sleepless nights. Later in that same book, when he was talking about imposters who were trying to discredit his ministry, he wrote, Are they servants of Christ? Am I out of my mind to talk like this? I am more. I have worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I was in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I've labored, I've toiled, I've often gone without sleep. I know hunger and thirst and I've often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern 
for all the churches. Now, I love that song that says, Count Your Many Blessings. I think that's a beautiful song. It's an inspiring song. It's a song that teaches us to do exactly what we as Christians need to do in order to be able to attain God's joy. But I have the suspicion that if I was experiencing the things that the Apostle Paul wrote about, things like being beaten up, things like being whipped by people who hated me, things like being stoned, having stones thrown at me, and then being thrown into a prison cell awaiting an unknown fate, I've got a suspicion that that song or any other song would not bring me a great deal of contentment. I would not feel like singing if I was going through those things, and yet that's exactly what the apostle did on one occasion. We are told he was preaching in the city of Philippi. Paul and his friend Silas were falsely arrested. They were beaten. They were fastened in stocks. They were left to rot in a dismal dungeon cell. And then in Acts 16:25 tells us at the midnight hour, while they were prisoners, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. That kind of response to that kind of situation defies my imagination. It literally makes no sense to me at all. I can't even begin to imagine how Paul and Silas could have possibly been singing and rejoicing in the midst of that kind of hardship and injustice, and yet that's precisely what they did. And more significantly than that, Paul wrote to the Philippians that, that as Christians, he's telling them, this is what you should be doing. In Philippians 4, 4 through 7, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So you might say, so Richard, are you saying that all I have to do to be contented in life is to sing, to pray, and to pretend that everything will turn out all right? No, that's not what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He's saying that our response to life should be to sing, should be to pray, and to always rejoice. There's no pretending involved here. You see, what took me by surprise was Paul's comment in verses 12 and 13 when he says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or whether I'm hungry, whether I'm living in plenty or in want. So there's a secret to this. It's not a matter of putting on a brave face. It's not a matter of putting your shoulders down and simply marching boldly through the hardships of life. There's a secret the Apostle Paul is giving us here in this passage. Well, what's the secret, Paul? What is it that would enable you to do such powerful things for God, to walk through the pain, to walk through the miseries of life with a heart that's rejoicing? What is your secret? The secret is, look there at verses 12 and 13, when he says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether I'm living in plenty or in want, I 
can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now, I used to think that that passage meant that Jesus would give me overwhelming strength to do mighty things in the name of God. But now I suspect Paul meant when life becomes unbearable, then it is the strength of Jesus Christ that gives us the ability to rise above our circumstances and to live triumphantly. You see, Paul's life was filled with difficulty. But notice Paul's eyes were always focused on God. It was focusing on God that made all the difference in the Apostle Paul's life. And I say to you, where you keep your eyes will influence how you respond to life. If you were to drop a bumblebee into a drinking glass, do you know what's going to happen? That bumblebee is going to buzz around the bottom of that glass literally until it dies. It never ever will see a means of escape at the top of the glass. But it will persist in trying to find some way out the side near the bottom of that glass. It will seek a way where no way exists until it completely destroys itself. Now, what was it about that situation that would destroy that bumblebee? It never, ever looked up. It looked around. It may have even looked within, but it never looked up. And that's how that bumblebee dies. What you look at will determine how you handle life's problems. I don't care if you're rich and powerful. I don't care if you're poor and destitute. If you don't look to God for strength in your life, you're always going to be defeated. You're always going to be depressed somewhere along the line. I believe that's part of the reason that Thoreau once observed that most of the people he knew live lives of quiet depression and desperation. There, there was once a financially poor woman by the name of Nancy. Nancy earned her living by hard living and hard labor. But who always, anytime you met Nancy, she was filled with joy because she had a relationship with Jesus Christ. One day a friend of hers decided she was going to try to talk Nancy into a more realistic view of life. And so this friend said to Nancy, Nancy, I know how happy you seem to be all the time, but have you ever thought what might happen in your life, what kind of struggles you might face in your life? Only suppose, for instance, you should have a spell of sickness and be unable to work. Or suppose that your present employer should move away and no one would hire you. And suppose, and about that time, Nancy got enough of this lady and Nancy cried out, Stop it. I never suppose. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, she said to her friend, you're always so miserable. I think it's all that supposing that you're doing that's making you so miserable and unhappy. What you ought to do is give up that supposing and just trust the Lord. Paul put it this way. If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? You see, it's in that confidence that we gain the ability to overcome the circumstances that we may encounter in life. It's in that confidence that we have the power to be overcomers of evil. But overcoming evil 
with good. Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. God's always near. God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And it's through God's presence and our consciousness of his presence that we are able to overcome. Probably need to get the worship team at this time as I'm coming to my conclusion. One writer, Warren Wearsby, wrote a book called Victorious Christian. Victorious Christian is a book about a lady by the name of Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby was the author of over, get this, over 8,000 songs. In fact, Fanny Crosby had to write many of those songs using a pseudo name just so she could get more of her songs into the hymn book. At six weeks of age, Fanny Crosby developed a minor eye infection or inflammation. Fanny Crosby's parents took her to the local doctor to be treated. However, the doctor who treated her used the wrong medicine on her eyes and she became totally and permanently blind as a result of this doctor's carelessness. When they interviewed Fanny Crosby later, years later, here's what Fanny Crosby said. If I could meet that doctor again, I would say to him, thank you, over and over and over again. Thank you for making me blind. She really felt that her blindness was a gift from God. And that gift from God helped her to write over 8,000 8, songs, most of them Christian hymns that just flowed from her mind and her life. Think about that, folks. How could Fanny Crosby, blinded by a tragic failure of a careless doctor, be filled with joy and power in the songs that she would write? I say to you, she kept her heart focused on God. You see, she was one, unlike that bumblebee, she looked up to God rather than around at her disability and her weaknesses. And she, along with the Apostle Paul, could say, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. Where are you focused today? What are you looking at today? If you're not looking to Jesus, you're looking to be defeated and lose. You're not going to be contented until you look to Jesus. And so I say to you, if you're here and you've never looked to Jesus, whatever you do, you need to take care of that today by coming forward as we come to our invitation song at this time.